Let's talk about the lower limb. Now we'll start with the hips, then we'll move on to knee and ankle. Now your hip joint is kind of like your shoulder joint, but instead of the humerus and going into a fossa in your scapula, we instead have the femur going into a fossa or a cavity in the pelvis. And that cavity we just call the acetabulum. So your femur and the acetabulum of your pelvis is your hip joint. Some common things that can go wrong, well we talked about one earlier, we, talk, we talked about avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Do you recall what artery usually causes that? Hopefully you do, I'm not gonna say it, but hopefully you do. So we talked about avascular necrosis, Something else you can have, you can just have fractures. So the fracture of your pelvis, fracture of your femur. Something you should know, if you, when you fracture your femur or any bone, you can release some of that fat that was in your bone marrow and that fat can go into your lungs and cause a fat embolism. So all right, fracture a bone. Look out for, for fat embolism. So a common thing they'll say is a person got into a car wreck, fractured their, their femur, and then suddenly they get short of breath, chest pain, that's fat embolism. Okay, that's a common one they like to ask that. So uh, motor vehicle accidents can cause a lot of hip problems. It can also, if it doesn't just straight out break your hip or break your femur, it can smash against your knee. If you're driving, you can smash your knee against the dashboard and it pushes your hip out of place, your femur out of place. What do we call that? We call it dislocation. And so if it pushes it backwards, what kind of dislocation is that? That'd be a posterior dislocation. So posterior dislocation is the most common. And again, usually from ve vehicular accidents where your knee just smashes against that dashboard and gets pushed back. These are common adult problems, common pediatric problems, pediatric. We include things like dysplasia of the hip. So this is when your acetabulum doesn't develop like it should. So instead of a nice deep cavity, you have a short cavity or a flat cavity and your femur can't invaginate and kind of create that joint. Instead it kind of rubs off it, dislocates very easily. So when you move the leg of the child, you'll hear clicking and clunking and all this stuff because that femur just kind of clicks and clunks against the flat acetabulum. So I'll just write clicks and clunks, clicks and clunks, clicks and clunks. And if you hear that in a newborn and you'll call your friendly pediatric orthopedic surgeon and they'll splint and kind of cast the femur into the pelvis and keep it there and push it there and then hopefully eventually a little cavity will form enough for it to stay there. That's dysplasia of the hip. You can also have something called slipped capital femoral epiphyses. This is often seen in overweight kids, so or obese kids, and it's a stress fracture. So just by looking at the femur, the femur is in a straight bone, it kind of comes in at an angle. And if this is your epiphyseal growth plate, if you're an overweight kid, you put a lot of stress on that epiphyseal growth plate, that kind of angle. Yeah, and if you put too much stress on it, you can have a stress fracture. And your metaphysis can kind of come apart at the seams and move away from it. So your metaphysis might look like this now. And we call that slipped capital femoral epiphyses. It's kind of like the epiphyses and the metaphysis have slipped apart, usually in overweight kids. Moving on, leg, calf, perf disease. This is just avascular necrosis of the femur. Why do we have a fancy name for this? Because it's idiopathic, we don't know what causes it. You see basically the femoral head dying and get all necrosed. Leg thought it was a avascular problem. Calf, calf thought it was a developmental problem, so rickets, 
Perth thought it was an infection that caused arthritis, but no one really knew, so they just call it idiopathic avascular necrosis or leg calf perf disease. And these are all common problems you'll see in your hip. Now let's move on to the knee. The structure of the knee can be quite complex, so we'll just draw it out. If this is your femur, and this is your tibia, aka okay, your shin bone, then lateral to it, you'll have your, I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> no, you can't see it, but lateral to it, you'll have your fibula. Fibula. This is your tibia. This is your femur. Now there are a lot of ligaments that keep this in place when you're moving, when you're active, you have a lot of stress on your knees. Move in at all different angles and you wanna keep it locked in place. On the lateral side, you have something that goes from your fibula to your femur. This lateral ligament. We call this lateral collateral ligament. If there's a lateral force that pushes it and tries to prise it apart, your LCL will keep it clamped down, keep these two together, sticks them together. On the medial side, you'll have something that attaches your tibia to your femur. What do you think we'll call this medial ligament? We'll call it the medial collateral ligament. And this, as you can imagine, if you have a lateral force coming this way, I'll try and pry your bones apart while your medial collateral ligament will keep them together and keep them from prying them apart. In between, you have these cushions these kind of crescent shaped cushions between the bones. And we call these meniscus. Meniscus just means crescent shape. So if you have one on your lateral side, we call that lateral meniscus. You have one on your medial side that actually connects to your MCL. They become one. We call that your medial meniscus. And then two more, and probably the most important ones. Let's draw a side view of this. So this would be a side view. All right, side view. So this is your tibia. This is your femur. This is the anterior side, posterior side, anterior side, posterior side. So we're looking at it like, like this. So your knee like this. And you have two ligaments that cross each other. We call these cruciate ligaments. Cruciate means cross. So one of the ligaments starts on the anterior tibia and kind of flies back and attaches to the back of your femur. So it flies back and attaches on there. So it goes from your anterior tibia reaches onto the back of your femur and kind of anchors it there. And if you try and push the tibia too far forward, it just uh, stops it and anchors it and holds it from going too far forward. And HCL is actually one of the most commonly torn ligaments because you can imagine why if you're running and you jump to a stop and all that forward momentum wants to push you forward, but the ACL is trying to hold it back. Yeah. All that movement trying to push the tibia forward and your ACL is stopping it from doing that. So it stops anterior movement. That's your ACL. Now, now there's another ligament that goes from your posterior tibia and attaches to the front of your femur. So it's anchoring it there and if you try and push the tibia back, then it'll anchor it and stop it from moving back. So it stops posterior movement. It's called your posterior cruciate ligament. That's your ACL and your PCL and you gotta be able to distinguish it on an MRI. If the MRI is a front view, you'll be able to see the ACL very well because it starts on the anterior tibia, so it'll be like that. And then the PCL will be this little dark nugget that you just can't really see because in the back. If they do a side view, then it's easy. The ACL will start from the front, move back. PCL will start from the back and move front. So that's your ACL, PCL. Let's talk about some common knee problems. You can damage any of the ligaments in the menisci we talked about above. And if someone comes in with a hurt knee and you wanna find out what's the problem, then you're gonna do history and a physical exam. You need to know the physical exam of the knee. A lot of times they'll just say the name of the test and then you have to figure out what was torn, okay? If we suspect the ACL, 
is torn, we can do some physical exam tests. So one of these will be your anterior draw test. You can imagine if your anterior cruciate ligament is fully torn, then nothing's holding your tibia back. You can just move that tibia forward at will. So the anterior draw test is just grabbing the tibia and pulling it forward. And if there's laxity, then that's a positive test. You're thinking your ACL is torn. Lockman test is the same thing, but instead of bending the knee at 90 degrees, you just bend it at 30 degrees. So all right, Lockman. If you suspect the PCL is torn, that's the thing that keeps your tibia from moving back, you can just push on the tibia and see if it moves back. That's posterior draw. But an easier thing to do is just kind of look at it on the side. You'll be able to see that the tibia is kind of sunken back. If you suspect the MCL and the LCL, all you have to do is apply force. So if you're applying medial adductive force, medial adductive, it shouldn't budge much if your LCL is there. But if it's not there, then it'll just open right up. So that touches your LCL. If you're applying lateral abductus force, lateral force, it shouldn't open much unless your MCL is torn. And if it is torn, then it'll open right up. So lateral abduction force, that's your MCL. Now finally, your menisci. Your menisci is tested with the McMurray test. This is a little bit more complicated. I wish I could show you, but you can't really see my legs. Um, you can look it up on YouTube. Basically, you twist the ankle and you twist the knee and you're kind of rocking it back and forth. You're trying to pin the menisci. Yeah, pin the menisci and you're moving the knee back and forth. And if it's torn, they'll feel the pain. You need to know that external rotation tests your medial menisci. Internal rotation tests your lateral. Now you can tear more than one ligament. In fact, you can tear three at a time. One of the most common ways to do that is if there's a giant lateral force. You know it's gonna push pressure on your medial collateral ligament and tear that. And because your medial collateral ligament's attached to your medial menisci, you'll tear that too. So right, plus medial menisci. And then lastly, your anterior cruciate ligament can be torn also, so plus ACL. So all three of these can be torn from any lateral force. And we call that the unhappy triad. Unhappy triad. So that's your ACL, your MCL, and your medial, medial meniscus. I think that's enough to talk about ligaments. Let's, go, let's talk about something else. We can talk about bursa. What are bursa? Bursa are these little fluid filled sacs. I'm out of markers, man. Bursas are these fluid filled sacs that you find in, in and around a lot of joints. And they just kind of cushion it. And you have one giant one called the pre patellar bursa. And if you're constantly kneeling or you're having repetitive trauma to it, it can inflame, cause enlargement, cause pain. We call that pre patellar bursitis. So you see this giant fluid filled sac in your knee. You can actually see it on MRI. I have a few pictures of my notes, make sure you see that. Now, you can also have a fluid filled sac on the back of your knee. That is also from your bursa, but it's due to something else. This is when the gastrocnemius semimembranous bursa connects to your joint. There's some sort of connection to your joint and the synovial fluid, the lubrication of your joint flows through that connection into your bursa and causes it to enlarge. So you have that fluid filled cyst on the back of your knee. So if this was your bursa and this was the knee joint, there'd be some sort of connection into the joint and the synovial fluid will leak into the bursa and cause it to enlarge way bigger than it should be. And you'll be able to see that on the back of the knee. We call that a Baker cyst. Baker's cyst. So a fluid filled sac in the front, prepatellar bursitis. A fluid filled sac in the back, Baker's cyst. Done with the knee, let's move on to the ankle. Most common thing you'll see in the ankle is ankle sprains. 
This is when you land wrong and you kind of hurt. Spring ankle, usually from an inversion of the ankle. Exversion is incredibly rare. You need a lot of force to evert your ankle. So it's usually an inversion. And the most commonly torn ligament is your ATL or your anterior talofibular ligament. Easy to remember ATL, I always think of always torn ligament. I've seen questions where they'll talk about ankle sprain. I'll look for ATL and it's not there. So the second most common torn is the calcaneal fibular ligament. So that's the second most commonly torn. So look out for both of them. Repetitive trauma, especially on the heel or the arch of your foot can cause plantar fasciitis. It's just a pain, especially when you're walking. Plantar fasciitis. You can have pain in the heel bone. So your heel bone is called the calcaneus. You might even see bone spurs. Oh, you remember bone spurs? We talked about that in osteoarthritis. Wasn't that from repetitive trauma? We're in here. So, cal so you might see that bone spur on your heels. Bone spur. The last thing I want to talk about is charcoal joint. Charcoal joint is destruction of your joint and deformity of your joint due to neuropathy. The most common cause of this neuropathy is going to be diabetes. So when you have neuropathy, you can't really feel your leg and you have repeated trauma, won't heal as well. You have all these ulcers and your foot will just be in bad shape. It will start to deform in the, and it also won't be able to maintain that arch in the foot. So you'll see this large deformed flat foot very very common in people with diabetes that's charcoal's joint that is your lower limb hope you enjoyed the video thanks